Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Asaf Bitterman um, from Sensible City Lab at MIT. Um, I'll talk today a little bit about um, the projects that we do in the lab, um, what motivated us to do them, and um, also how it relates to new possible types of governance. So if we go back uh, to the early 90s, many people thought that virtual networks uh, virtual environments will somehow replace urban density. People thought that the fact that we can get excited over the network, uh, visually, audibly, tangibly, uh, will mean that we don't need to get so close to each other anymore. Um, this is a quote from, <clears throat> from George Gilder in 1995, who said that we're headed for the death of cities, that they're a leftover baggage from the industrial era. Um, now, we know that uh, the case was quite the opposite. Uh, last year, uh, first time in history that more than half the globe lived in cities, but also there are all sorts of economies of scale associated with living in cities. Um, road length is shorter per capita the bigger the city is. Um, the emissions are smaller per capita the bigger the city is. Um, most of the GDP in the world is produced by cities, but also um, they emit the most. Um, uh, globally. So, um, in a sense, cities become a focal point as we try to move towards a healthier future um, for our planet. Now, what we do at the Sensible City Lab is look at how this digital layer, which did not really kill our cities, uh, is recombining with it in new ways. Um, is there a new type of planning that arises from this? Is there a new way to manage our resources in cities as information recombines? Can we create a new experience of cities, a new connection between people, technology, and urban space? So uh, to do this, we partner with all sorts of cities around the world and companies. Um, and um, in each place, we, um, sorry, you're asking for something? Um, in each place, we, um, uh, we develop a test case uh, implementation, an urban demo that somehow illustrates our vision uh, for that place. So I'll, I'll show a few of those and um, end with a little teaser. Uh, this is a project we did in, um, in Venice at the Biennale of Architecture 2006. It focused on Rome. There we were um, interested in seeing how can you take existing data, stuff that's on uh, you know, mobile device network, uh, our public transportation network, buses and taxis, and use it to describe what's going on in the city in real time. Now, we were lucky enough that uh, Italy was playing France uh, in the World Cup uh, that year. Uh, so we grabbed data from Telecom Italia about the number of megabytes consumed on each cell phone tower as people were watching the game in bars and in public places in Rome. Now, check out what happens. Uh, you know, uh, this is a typical morning. You can see activity starting to build up in the city. The area on the top left is where a lot of bars were and uh, uh, public screens. Now, at uh, 7.45, game begins. Silent. Nobody talks. France scores. It's 1-0. Now, half time, people go to the bathroom, make a quick call. Second half, it's 1-1. Now, first overtime. Second overtime, still 1-1. Then Zidane gives the headbutt to Materazzi. Everybody goes crazy. And Italy wins. People stay up all night, party till 3 AM. And they go to sleep. The next day, uh, the winning team came from Germany and met with the prime minister there. And they went in a parade down to Circo Massimo, which is down there. So in a sense, we see that this creates almost an emotional map of what was happening in the city during that event. But we've been using this data um, as it collected on our server since, uh, since the exhibition, to actually study in more detail, we can tell uh, land use distributions by the way people use the cell phone. So you notice here, there's something, the pattern was something like coming together, quiet, break, quiet, then something off. If you cluster the city using very simple signal processing techniques, you can tell every place where people are watching sports, for example. And that's, uh, and that's using totally anonymous data. This is just an example. You can do the same for retail space, for uh, residential areas. And this becomes very important as we uh, start moving towards um, 
um, a type of planning which uh, stacks different types of land use over time. So we don't want to distribute our cities anymore like you know, we did in the 50s where you lived somewhere and you went to work somewhere else and you had fun in another part of town demanding a lot of travel in between. So as cities began to have stacked land use like our medieval cities did, uh, these types of observations can become very powerful. Now, <clears throat> as you put this information together with other types of data, you can start suggesting analysis. Here, you see the uh, location of buses in real time. And from the cell phone information, we extracted using velocity and acceleration uh, the presence of pedestrians. Now, this was all done on the Telecom Italia servers. And they aggregate and anonymize everything and send it to us on those pixel areas, which are about 250 meters by 250 meters. Um, and when you have these two data sets in real time, you can start asking questions like, do we still need to chase the buses, or can the buses come to meet us? So from, a, from an algorithmic standpoint, there are solutions uh, that are quite simple to these problems. You see bus routes still emerge, but then every once in a while, they need to go off route to pick up people, depending on what is different that day from the uh, normal routine. Now, this project we showed in uh, MoMA last year. Um, it was a partnership with AT&T, where we looked at the much larger scale of communication. There, we were um, studying the connection of New York with the rest of the world. This map shows IP traffic between New York and 200 other global cities. Um, and using this data, you can start um, addressing some of the key questions in urban economics, for example. Um, there has been a lot theorized uh, in the past few decades about the networks of cities, the sub-networks of cities that form the global economies, like clicks that trade between them. Uh, and this type of data allows you to put quantitative analysis behind these, uh, um, behind these hypotheses. Now, if you zoom in on the neighborhood level, let me stop here for a second. Now, you zoom in on the neighborhood level, uh, this is landline calls coming in and out. Uh, and we can do this for the whole of New York. Suddenly, you can get a very detailed demographic decomposition of the place. Um, I mean, if, I don't know if any of you know Flushing. Uh, it used to be a Korea town, but now it's becoming a Chinatown. So you still see Seoul up there, but Shanghai and Beijing are slowly climbing up. And, and you can do this for the rest of the city. Um, it becomes almost like a real-time census. You don't need to wait 10 years for the census to come around. It's very expensive to do. Think about places that don't even have census in the developing world. Suddenly, you can use this data, which is ubiquitous. It exists everywhere to study cities and respond to demographic changes very quickly. OK, now I'll talk about garbage. Uh, this project, um, unlike the previous two, where we piggybacked on um, existing infrastructure to describe the city, uh, you know, we grab stuff that's already existing on the cell phone network or on the public transportation network, on the you know, long distance call network. Here, we deployed our own tags to create maps of real-time flows of garbage. This uh, project was done in partnership with uh, Waste Management. It's uh, the biggest um, waste removal company here in the country. Um, and motivated by uh, an exhibition called Toward a Sentient City. It's now on show at the... Uh, Architecture League of New York. And um, we also um, showed the visualizations created for this project uh, at the Seattle Public Library. Just came off last week, actually. So many people have been talking about this idea of smart dust, little small computational elements with sensors, maybe, connected to each other that can be distributed in our environments, communicating with each other. Now, if you think of what happens when everything becomes ubiquitous, where you can know where every object is, what it is. We would like to see if we can imagine situations of minimum waste. Can we create optimal resource allocation by knowing what something is and what it should be, uh, how it should be treated, what it could be recombined with to create something new? Um, now, this is a map uh, that was created at the Media Lab looking at the supply chain. What, is, uh, what are the processes that bring together this computer all the way to my office at MIT? Um, over the past three decades, supply chain has become extremely efficient uh, because, in many ways, because of uh, 
of information technologies. We know that the parts were produced in China, then they were shipped to Cupertino, where they were, where they were assembled, and then shipped to a distribution center, then to Massachusetts, etc. But when you throw this away, we have some belief that it's being taken care of in an appropriate way. But many times we see something goes to the wrong place, maybe something gets shipped overseas where we don't really know how it gets uh, dealt with. So can we really get to the same level of knowledge about this device as we do in terms of supply chain when we get rid of it? So to do this, uh, we developed a set of sensors um, based on cell phone technology. This is, uh, this is our second version. I'll show it in a sec. This is the recent one we're working on with Qualcomm. Um, we then invited people in Seattle, uh, hundreds of members of the community there, uh, to um, tag their garbage, then throw it uh, as they would have otherwise. Um, and then these tags in real time send signals to us, to our servers at MIT, where we run visualizations with them that reveal the paths of garbage as it moves through the city towards its uh, final destination. This is the first version of the tag we developed. The challenge is to make it as small as possible and uh, to get the, to the battery life um, as long as possible on a single charge. You can't really recharge it when it's in the garbage. Um, this was the second version of the tag that we developed. This one can live for up to six months on a single charge. <clears throat> the, um, the most recent one we're developing um, with Qualcomm and with Sprint um, also uses GPS, so not only um, cell technology for location, but the GPS and the better of the two uh, can get us pretty good results for locationing. Now we needed to develop all sorts of, uh, or to find all sorts of materials that we can use to tag different types of trash. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a very different process to tag a rotten tomato and a TV. Um, so this is, you see foam here on the left and this was rubber, that's what we use to tag e-waste. Um, and um, together with a, uh, a, a specialist of end of life of objects at MIT named uh, Tim Gutowski, uh, we developed something like a wedding wish list of trash. Um, and it, we put it on the web, and when volunteers join, uh, they take the stuff that they can actually um, uh, find in their houses. The objective was to create as good a representation as possible of the production of domestic uh, household waste. Uh, we also put particular emphasis on objects that have uh, a special impact on the environment. These are pictures from our, uh, uh, our first deployment in Seattle. People actually came to the public library with their trash, and we helped them tag it. You see the different materials there. Uh, this is me operating on a teddy bear. We tagged anything from TVs to uh, tires and ceramic bowls. This is from our first uh, test in, uh, in Boston, where we wanted to see if the tags actually transmit in the garbage system, which wasn't a trivial thing. You can also um, make fun visualizations, like you fly through the city on the path of a piece of garbage. Yeah, eventually we, uh, we chose to go with this type of visual. This is an example of uh, the trajectory uh, a yogurt container took in uh, Seattle. And uh, this, this is the visualization we showed um, in the public library in Seattle and that we're currently showing at the uh, Architectural League of New York. What you see in the background is, uh, is video taken at the waste management um, uh, waste separation facility in Baltimore. Uh, it was done by uh, video artist Armin Linke. Um, and in the front of it, you see a map. It basically it scrolls through the objects that are in the system one by one, and it shows you from the place and time where it was disposed, where has it, got, where has it gotten to, till the current uh, moment. It shows you how many miles it traversed, what it is, what material it's made of, and so on and so forth for many objects. We currently have 2,000 objects, almost 2,000 tagged in the city, and this coming weekend, uh, we're tagging the last 1,000 objects, uh, which will be the end of this project. Now, let me quiet this down for a bit. For this project, there are two main things we're 
hoping to achieve. The first one is seeing what kind of increased awareness can arise from this. I mean, if I, I don't know where my plastic cup is, but if I knew that the plastic cup that I threw, say, a couple of days ago is sitting on some hill, uh, not far away from my house, and it's gonna stay there, what kind of impact would it have on me? You know, many of us, uh, when we throw something away, we think it's gone. But suddenly this thing brings it to light and, um, and actually shows us that it's still there and it has an impact. So we're looking to see if there's a prospect for behavioral change there. And uh, the second thing is, uh, and I guess that's primarily why Waste Management partnered with us for this, is to see as this data aggregates on our servers, what can we learn from this? You can run very, um, you can run powerful statistical analysis on all these traces uh, to see what goes where, are the processes optimal, can we rethink some of them, um, and uh, hopefully improve the waste management system altogether. So now I'm gonna take a little step back and um, look at what can we possibly get um, out of all this data that's around us. Um, if we think of different types of data, say, uh, um, from the infrastructure networks, such as the uh, cell phone networks, the public transportation networks, uh, data about energy consumption, about waste removal, about um, sewer, a lot of these networks are computerized. They emit data that can become very useful for studying place, for helping us make better decisions. But this can combine then with our own generated data, with our tweets, with our uh, tagged Flickr photos. Um, and it could come together with government data, with census data, with information about the status of various infrastructures. So in a sense, there's a real opportunity here for great applications that could benefit the public good Something similar to what happened, what we saw happen on the web uh, that was driven by the developers community when mashups were created. You know, a hacker can take a, a map and a, and, a, and a piece of news and make a service. Now the strong ones survive. Can we see the same type of innovation happen to our urban spaces? Now for this to happen, we need platforms that are uh, open enough um, that can let this data come together and be open for applications to lie on top. Now, Considerations of privacy are, are crucial. Uh, who owns this type of infrastructure? Who manages it? But we're seeing that more and more government uh, bodies are becoming aware of the potential in this. Uh, the federal government started the data.gov initiative recently, which opens up some uh, government data sets for external apps. Uh, uh, this is the uh, datasf.org. San Francisco, we've seen uh, a lot of applications already written on top of that data. Uh, New York also did something like this. This is an app competition called NYC Big Apps. Uh, the Oakland Crime Spotting, which uh, uses uh, data to show people trends of crime uh, in their neighborhoods. And uh, on this topic, we created um, a conference that was actually conducted uh, 10 days ago at MIT, where we brought together regulators, scientists that do cool stuff with data, privacy officers from the big telcos, um, and uh, privacy advocates to, see, to, to engage in sort of a broad discussion of, A, understanding what is the value proposition here? What can be done that's in our benefit using this data? What are the risks to privacy? And what are the best practices that we need to put in place so that we can all gain from this new condition? Now, I'll end with a note on the uh, next project coming up. Uh, this is uh, gonna be unveiled at the COP15 um, event in, uh, in Copenhagen, the Climate Summit. Um, when we went there, we, I mean, we probably, whoever was there probably noticed that there's, there are a lot of bikes. Um, a lot, like 520,000 people in the city, 600,000 bikes. And um, we're wondering, okay, this, a bike is probably one of the more efficient machines we've invented, but is there a small technological augmentation we can do to it that can suddenly make it smart, aware? Can it tell us something about us, about the environment? Now, we didn't want to go this route because uh, a lot of the electric uh, bicycle we see today are a little bit clunky uh, and heavy, expensive. Now, sensor-enabled bikes are, not, yet, are not, not there yet either. So we've come up with this. This is a hybrid bicycle wheel. It harvests your energy when you brake. It powers up an array of environmental sensors. It has NOx, CO2, CO, O3. It also has location in it, so location uh, sensing. 
It can also give you a push if you want. It measures your effort when you pedal, and if you want, it could supplement it, uh, depending on measures you set. Uh, so this wheel almost becomes like your friend. It can tell you how well you're doing physically. Uh, it can tell you what quality of air you breathe. You can share it with your friends on the network. You can share it with a municipality if you want, anonymously, and you know, then everybody can benefit from this sort of swarm of, of uh, bicycles surveying the environment. And uh, this is a plug-in that you can put in any bike. You just need to replace the back wheel. So it has standard uh, spacing there. So it's going to be shown uh, in a conference that's called the Climate Summit for Mayors. Uh, our slot is on the 15th of, uh, of December. It's going to be there all week, but uh, we're going to give a big presentation. So if any of you is in Copenhagen, come see us. We're just after a very nice keynote by uh, former President Clinton and a, um, there's a press conference with a lot of uh, mayors from the bigger cities around the world. Um, so it's going to be a party. See you there.